Welcome also from my side. My name is Melanie Schiller and I'm a professor, uh, assistant professor for media studies and popular music at the Department for Arts, Culture and Media here in Groningen, uh, where I mostly teach in the program for popular music, sound and media cultures. Together with Leonie, who you've already met, and our colleague Lisa Gaufmann, who is also in the audience here. Hello, Lisa. You will see more of her later in the series. Uh, I'm one of the co-organizers of this lecture series, so welcome everyone. I am also involved in an ongoing research project on popular music and populism, uh, about which I am sure our first speaker today, Mario Dunkel, will say more in a minute. Now, when conceptualizing a lecture about populism and popular music, a lot of questions come to mind, of course. Regarding populism, there is ample literature and debate, both academically and in the media, about the quote-unquote global rise of populism. But populism is, of course, a notoriously complex phenomenon that takes different shapes in different contexts, and which is therefore also difficult to define. Although uh, most agree that it is based on a basic antagonism between the people and some sort of elite, some argue that it is an ideology, that, is, that it is a discourse, that it is a political strategy, or that it is a style. That pop populism is an emancipatory force, empowering the people, or the opposite, that it is a threat to democracy. In this series, we will therefore hear different approaches to populism in different contexts. All speakers, however, are interested in how populism and different forms of popular culture interact. Our popular culture, similar to populism, is yet another contested and complex concept. Especially in the field of cultural studies, debates about popular culture, what it is and why it matters, have a long tradition. While some have argued that popular culture as mass culture is a tool for suppressing and manipulating the people, others have argued the opposite, that popular culture is in fact a site of negotiation or resistance towards dominant ideologies or quote unquote the power block. Stuart Hall, for instance, has importantly reminded us that popular culture is one of the sites where a notion of the people is established in the first place. So from this point of view, it should not come as a surprise that populist leaders, parties, and movements often explicitly draw on popular culture to disseminate their ideas and to articulate their version of the people, for instance, in social media, internet memes, and computer games. So there are many cultural, uh, there are many conceptual overlaps in discussions about both populism and popular culture that we want to explore in this series. But also a number of questions arise. Like, what is the relationship between populism and the popular? What does it mean when populism takes the shape of popular culture? Or when popular culture disseminates populist discourses? And what is the role of the audience in all of this? The speakers in this series will therefore look at a different or a diverse range of topics, including, amongst others, populism and influences, celebrity culture, and today, populism and popular music. A few words about the concept of the series. Our idea was mostly to bring together different approaches to understanding the connections between populism and popular culture, but also to start a dialogue that especially goes beyond disciplinary boundaries. So we have a very diverse audience and we have also very diverse speakers from different uh, disciplinary backgrounds. And we opted for uh, almost weekly lecture series. Uh, and the idea is here that we can have some kind of a coherent conversation that runs across the different perspectives that we hear and the different talks that we hear so that we can sort of return every week to the discussions of last week. Um, we are therefore especially also inviting the speakers to engage with each other's ideas in the discussions and refer to our own talks and, and have a dialogue with all of us. And on a final note, of course, we want to thank our organizing partners, the Honinger Institute for the Study of Culture, ICOG, the Research Center for Arts and Society, the Research Center for the Study of Democratic Cultures and Politics in Honinger, and the research project Popular Music and the Rise of Populism in Europe, financed by the Volkswagen Foundation. For now, though, let me briefly introduce our first speaker of the series, Mario Dunkel from the University of Oldenburg in Germany. Mario Dunkel is a professor of music education and he holds a PhD in American studies. His main research areas are music and politics, the history of history and practice of jazz, as well as transcultural music education. His articles have appeared in American Music, the European Journal of Musicology and Popular Music and Society, amongst others. He is also the co-editor of Popular Music and Public Diplomacy, published in 2018. 
Finally, Mario and I know each other very well since he's also the principal investigator of the research project that I've already mentioned, Popular Music and the Rise of Populism in Europe, funded by the Volkswagen Foundation. Today, the Mario will also talk about listening to populism in European popular music. We are looking forward to that, Mario. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you so much, Melanie. Um, thank you, Leonie. Thank you, um, Lisa, for, for inviting me uh, and for this um, great initiative. Um, I will now try to share my presentation. Um, one second. Okay, can you see the presentation okay? Perfect. Yes. All right, thanks. All Great. good. Um, okay. Uh, so in, in addition to uh, thanking the, the organizers, I would also like to thank my colleagues and in the, in the project Popular Music and the Rise of Populism in Europe. Uh, much of what I will be talking about draws on our exchanges. Um, and uh, one second. Okay. And these are my colleagues in that in that project, um, and um, yeah, I, I will be I will be drawing on on the exchanges that we've had in that project. Um, so, what do we hear when we listen for populism in popular music? The area of popular music and populism is vast, and there's no way for me to cover it even remotely in this talk. I would argue that the first challenge in listening for populism lies in acknowledging the vastness of this field as opposed to the relative narrowness of individual listening habits. I like to divide perspectives on popular music and populism into two larger categories. First, we can address how popular music is connected to populist politicians and political actors. Examples in this area include a wide array of political ideologies in the US alone, these range from the use of music by Donald Trump to Barack Obama's and Bernie Sanders campaign playlists, which have been discussed as populist. Um, and it literally pains me to, uh, to mention these names in one in the same sentence, but I'm trying to outline the immense scope of this field here. Outside of the US, populist politicians and pol political actors whose use of music has been addressed include Beppe Grillo, Matteo Salvini in Italy, the Freedom Party of Austria, Fidesz in Hungary, um, the Sweden Democrats, the Finns Party in Finland, Turkish Prime Minister Recep Tayyip Erdogan, Philippine President Rodrigo Duterte, and the British Labour Party, among others. Populist parties and politicians may make use of music in various ways. They appropriate celebrity musicians and publicize their musical taste in order to associate themselves with cultural icons. This is the case when, for instance, the Italian far-right politician Matteo Salvini claims the iconic singer, songwriter, and anarchist Fabrizio De Andre as his favorite singer. By associating with Andre, De, De Andre, um, Salvini can perform his private persona, his personal music taste, his deep connection with Italian cultural history, and with a highly esteemed singer-songwriter celebrated for giving voice to everyday people. In addition to appropriating specific musical icons, populist politicians also make use of music's narrative and effective power, its potential to create feelings that bond us, that solidify communities. This may happen at campaign events, party organized festivals, but also, also in, in all kinds of digital media. Some populist politicians even run bands or perform as singers, of course, this may be true for non-populist politicians as well. So we may ask what is unique or special about the use of music by populist political actors. And I will address this later uh, in my talk. Now, in addition to this focus on politicians and political parties, I would like to explore a second perspective on the field of popular music and populism. This perspective requires focusing on interactions between popular music and populism beyond the use of music by professional politicians and parties. These interactions can be blatantly obvious, such as when celebrity musicians make populist statements or write and perform populist protest songs. A German R&B singer Xavier Naidoo's song Raus aus dem Reichstag is an example of this. The song reaffirms conspiracist anti-Semitic tropes 
and fantasizes about violence against politicians and the corrupt political media and financial elite. The recent phenomenon of Eric Clapton performing protest songs against government measures to contain the COVID-19 pandemic is another example that is popular in many countries. If you're not uh, familiar with his recent work, check out his songs. Um, this has got to stop, released about a week ago, and um, The Rebels. The field of popular music and populism, however, is larger than such a focus on protest music by celebrity musicians would suggest. For one, populist music performances occur on an amateur level, as well as on a professional one. The pandemic has seen the popular success of populist performances by many amateur musicians on social media, for instance. And the fact that a performance may be read as populist does not entail that it triggers populist behavior or attitudes among audiences. If music reception is a creative process that involves the active negotiation of meanings, then research on popular music and populism has to include reception practices. It needs to consider all kinds of what Christopher Small calls musicking, including singing in stadiums, dancing on the street, making sense of music's meanings, and the creative practices of listening in everyday culture. Now, in light of this vastness of the field, I would nonetheless like to suggest a definition of populism that can help us to approach the nexus of populism and popular music in Europe and elsewhere. Since this is the first lecture in this series, I will dwell for a little while on definitions of populism and how they relate to popular music. I would then like to talk about the particular field of populism and nationalism in European popular music cultures. And lastly, I would like to give you some insight into research my colleague Anna Schwenk and I have done on popular music and populism in Germany. I will focus on two quite divergent examples that nonetheless share commonalities in how they perform populism. The first example concerns the use of music by the far-right populist Alternative für Deutschland. And this will be situated in the, the first category of perspectives that I just sketched. And the, sec the second example is taken from the second category of perspectives, popular music beyond party politics, and focuses on a music video by the contemporary German Schlager band Dorfrocker. I aim to show both how investigating popular music is crucial to understanding populism and how, in turn, the concept of populism is central to understanding contemporary popular music cultures in Germany and other European countries. So what is populism? Over the past five years, numerous introductions and reference works have appeared on the topic of populism. And it has become a cliche to point to the fact that populism is notoriously difficult to define. Indeed, there are quite divergent scholarly approaches to populism. Populism has been defined as a historically grounded social movement dating back to the 19th century populist party in the US, a type of economic policy, communication style, a political strategy, a thin-centered ideology, a discourse, and a performative style. And despite these differences, there is a broad consensus in populism research that first, populism is based on a binary distinction between two groups, the people and the elite, and second, that these two groups are antagonistic to one another. And this antagonism can be described as primarily vertical. Um, cast as a power block, the elite is placed on top of the social order, seeking to maintain its hegemony by exerting control over the people at the bottom. Importantly, I do not regard populism as an inherent threat to democracy or as essentially anti-pluralist or anti-democratic. My approach thus differs strongly from a populism as threat school of populism theory that is popular in German speaking contexts and is associated with political scientist Jan Werner Müller and the populism surveys of the, of the Bertelsmann Foundation in Germany. In general, populism is highly adaptable and may have both anti democratic and democratizing functions. It depends on its context. I will mostly draw on discursive performative approaches to populism. Um, those were 
co-developed by some of the researchers who I noticed will also be giving talks within this lecture series. If you're interested, check out the talks by Benjamin Moffat and uh, Ruth Wodak, for instance. Discursive performative approaches focus on how populist discourses and performances articulate, affirm, and emotionally charge the people, the elite, and elements that help to construct the antagonism between these groups. Populist performances, for instance, may negotiate group identities, group resentments, and effective communities or communities of feeling. A shared group identity of the people can, for instance, be constituted by what populism researcher Pierre Ostigi has called the flaunting of the low. That is the celebration and circulation of what is widely considered lowbrow, bad manners, uncouth behavior, coarse language, rawness, seemingly working class styles, and so on. The performance of antagonistic class-related styles and aesthetics, therefore, is a central element of populism. Approaches concentrating on popular music can contribute to better understanding populism as a discursive performative phenomenon in several ways. First, they can explore the role of sound and music in the performance and construction of the people and the elite. This includes the sonic aspects of flaunting the low, for instance, as well as the sonification of a corrupt elite. Music may also be used by actors wishing to musically position themselves as members of, or even as the voice of the people. Second, music-related approaches can examine music's role in establishing, affirming, and giving meaning to antagonisms between these two groups. Examples include the musicalization of resistance to the elite and the musical glorification of those who seem to challenge the elite's power, including such figures as the rebel, um, and Eric Clapton comes to mind again, or, um, or the superhero. And third, music may serve to tie populism to other related discourses. Both ideational and discursive performative approaches assume that populism appears in conjunction with other ideologies or discourses, ranging from nationalism to nativism and socialism. Although it is important to theoretically distinguish between populism and other discourses and ideologies, popular music culture does not always isolate them from one another, but rather tends to enmesh and blend them. This latter point, is significant when we try to approach the concrete field of contemporary popular music and populism in Europe. The last decade has seen the rise of what Lawrence Rosenthal calls populism's toxic embrace of nationalism in Europe and the US. We may add that populism and xenophobic nationalism had embraced one another long before the 2010s. If we think of Austrian politician Jörg Haider, for instance, who, by the way, also performed as a singer However, the large scale rise of far right populist discourses throughout European countries is a rather recent phenomenon. Many factors have been identified that led up to this development from the political response to the financial crisis of the late 2000s uh, and the neoliberal financial regime that caused this crisis to an increase in economic insecurity, changes in migration dynamics, such as the so-called refugee crisis in 2015, larger technological transformations, developments in media culture, progressive value change leading to a far-right populist backlash, um, and the diminishing influence of an old establishment in various social, political, and economic sectors, um, among others. As cultural studies theory holds, however, the large-scale popular success of populism and nationalism would be unthinkable without corresponding changes on a cultural level in the structures of feeling, systems of meaning, and orders of knowledge with which people make sense of their everyday lives. And popular music is a fundamental aspect of those changes. Not only does popular music culture provide a realm in which politics, in a narrow sense, as the business of government and party politics is reflected upon, but popular music culture is also political in a broader sense, as it helps to create bonds between people, to form effective communities, to negotiate interests and meanings. As John Street, Sarah Inthorn, and Martin Scott put it, the pleasures of popular culture are closely allied with the ways in which citizenship is lived. 
The first example I would like to discuss illustrates how people actively perform populism and nationalism in contemporary European popular music culture. I like to use this example since it illustrates the extent to which popular music is relevant in our current political moment. And I would like to thank my project partners Emilia Bana and uh, Agnes Patak Falvicejak for introducing our team to this example, the song Nelkület by the Hungarian far-right rock band Izmeres Arzog. If you want to read up on the detailed history of the song, uh, Emilia and Agnes are currently preparing this publication on it. And they're also in this room, I think, so you can also write them in the private chat if you like. <laughs> um, Ismarish Arzog released Nel Coulette in 2007 on their album Eberalom. Since then, it has seen an extraordinary history of popularization. Initially, the song became an anthem of the Hungarian speaking people outside the borders of Hungary. In the 2010s, the Hungarian speaking soccer club FK DAC Dunajska Streda in Slovakia used the piece as its anthem and developed a kind of ritual. Before the home game, different singers, including a girl, and a pair of children walk around the soccer pitch equipped with a microphone and sing Nelkuled to a playback electric piano accompaniment. The pop ballad is kept in a slow moving tempo so that music and the singer's movement harmonize with each other. The entire piece is accompanied by fan chants in the stands, which seem to be lyrically confident even in the verses. At the same time, many of the fans wear their fan paraphernalia on display holding their fan scarf up with both hands outstretched. Occasionally flags are also waved. Between the yellow blue colors of the club, the red, white, green national colors of Hungary appear occasionally. And uh, I would like to show you a 2019 recording of a performance in Dunajska Streda. So the productions of these performances have been refined over the past years. While the first performances of the song were still recorded with a single camera, more recent videos alternate between different camera perspectives, showing either the stadium from a bird's eye view, the fans or the singers from different angles. One camera usually follows the singers as they walk across the pitch. It seems as if the actual event is not the soccer match itself, but the ritual that precedes it. In fact, the ritual has become so popular that it is performed and sung not only before home games of the Slovak club, but also before international games of the Hungarian national soccer team in Hungary's largest stadium, the Pushkash Arena in Budapest. The, ex the exceedingly high number of views of these videos on YouTube also suggests that this is more than a regional phenomenon in a Slovakian small town. The lyrics provide a first indication of how populism and nationalism interact here. The speaker, and in the stadium performance, also the singers and the choir of spectators turn to their homeland, Hungary, in a kind of declaration of love. Since they feel deeply connected to it, their permanent separation from their homeland is comparable to death, like a river that has lost its water, like a sea that falls into dry dust. Because of this death-like separation, the speaker lives in a state of permanent discord that could only be ended by reunification with the homeland. However, there is no hope for this anymore. Instead, the speaker sings defiantly that they remain inseparably connected to Hungary in two ways. One historical and one biological. In the piece, the Hungarian community is constituted not only by the common experience of having lived through difficult times, but also by its biological ancestry. Thus, in a kind of climax, thousands of stadium visitors repeat the words, we are of one blood. These nationalist and nativist elements are supplemented in the course of the piece by tropes related to populism. Thus, the lyrics contain references to domination and oppression. The free expression of the speaker who represents the voice of the people is endangered. If the speaker does not say what they have to say right away, they may not get the chance to do so. At the same time, the people are degraded and relegated to the bottom of the social structure. Thus, they are compared to a stone kicked aside and to a wanderer silently begging for food. The horizontal level of nationalism inside and outside is thus complemented here by the vertical structure uh, below and above of, of populism. Even though the elite is not directly named, the lyrics raise questions about who is to blame for the people's fate. 
In other words, whose foot kicks the stone? The music is highly participatory and supports these populist and nationalist tropes. The melody mostly moves in tonal steps and has a small range, inviting listeners to sing along. Harmonically, melodically, and also rhythmically, the piece uses common schemes of pop music quite cleverly. The verse consists of a variation of a sequence of descending fifths, for instance, common in popular songs from, from Autumn Leaves to I Will Survive, and therefore affording feelings of familiarity. In addition to such harmonic techniques, the lyrics are supported by rhythmic and melodic accents. For example, a leap to the highest melodic note of the piece, which occur occurs on the first beat, marks the words, whatever happens, and thereby underscores the unconditionality of the speaker's loyalty. Further dimensions of meaning are evoked by the joint performance in a soccer stadium. The two children who sing the song while holding hands can also be read in this context as a promise for the future of the ethnic community of the people. The stadium provides a circular space for acoustic resonance and the experience of shared sentiments. If populism has to do with the mobilization of affects and emotions that give meaning to the conceptual division of society and to a people versus an elite, then performances of the song can help to tie populist and nationalist ideas to shared musical experiences. If we keep this example in mind and turn our attention to Germany, um, we can first note that a political development has taken place in Germany in recent years that has led to a blend of populism and nationalism being increasingly influential in parliaments and public discourse. This is particularly evident in the history of the Alternative für Deutschland party. Um, as Wilhelm Heidmeier has shown, since its foundation in 2013, the party has undergone a development from a primarily Eurosceptic market liberal party to a primarily authoritarian nationalist one with a strong far right extremist branch. For this reason, Heidmeier rejects the term right wing populism for the AFD as trivializing and suggests the term authoritarian national radicalism instead. Although Heidmeier is correct in claiming that populism as a concept bears the risk of trivializing the party's far-right extremism, I would argue that the concept should not be completely dismissed in relation to the AFD. It can rather be employed as a complementary perspective that can help us to better understand the party's political style. The fact that the party is populist does not mean that it is less radical, less nationalistic, or less authoritarian. Now let's take a look at one of the party's demonstrations to see how a discursive performative approach to populism can help us make sense of its use of music. On March 25 in uh, 2019, the AFD organized a demonstration in Rostock Reutershagen. This demonstration was directed against the construction of a mosque in the Reutershagen district. In addition to political speeches, the party organized a march through the streets of Reutershagen. The demonstrators were accompanied by a light lorry painted in AFD colors and equipped with loudspeakers that provided a soundtrack to the event. The playlist included German language folk songs, chansons, excerpts from Hollywood film music, such as Pirates of the Caribbean, excerpts from an opera by Richard Wagner, recordings of Gotthilf Fischer's amateur choirs, German language Schlager songs from Raffi Deutscher to Gunther Gabriel, German language R&B with gangster rap interjections by Xavier Naidu, and to my surprise, also Islamic religious music. The latter was um, likely an attempt to render audible the demonstration's threat scenario of Islamization. Um, and this is an excerpt of the, um, the AFD's official live stream of the event. So there, there seems to be at least a tension here between the parties striving for cultural homogenization on the one hand and its heterogeneous choice of music on the other. In a way, the playlist reveals a dilemma of the AFD to popularize its agenda of cultural homogenization, the party relies on popular cultures and musics that are deeply pluralized. 
From a populism theoretical perspective, however, the music selection seems less incongruent. The fact that the organizers of this demonstration play the 1996 piece, Sei Wachsam, Be Vigilant, by the iconic singer and songwriter Reinhard May, for example, may seem confusing. After all, May locates himself more in the left wing political spectrum. However, due to its open populism, the song lends itself particularly well to transfers between very different populist discourses. The song uses the concept of the people and among other things, resorts to the idea that a corrupt elite of politician, clergy, media moguls, newspaper czars, and other profiteers have conspired against the people and want to keep them stupid and poor. The corruptness of this elite is made evident by the fact that they are not what they claim to be, but merely youthful old men who, quote unquote, suck up and lick boots. Moreover, the song provides a populist explanation of the way in which the elite exercises its power over the people, namely by spreading lies through the media and thus keeping the people stupid. Media criticism tends to be common in populism, but in this case, the elite's control over the media is exaggerated to such an extent that it becomes strongly connectable to the frame of fake news or Lügenpresse used by the AFD. The lyrics of the song also show parallels to the rhetoric of the AFD in other places. For example, comparisons are drawn between the German government and the Nazi dictatorship, similar to the comparisons made in recent years by AFD representatives between Angela Merkel and Adolf Hitler. In addition, the piece claims that the rule of law is threatened by politicians manipulating the German basic law. This trope also corresponds to the party's current we are basic law campaign, which characterizes the basic law as a severely threatened achievement and accuses the elite of undermining it. It would be possible to understand the selection of many of the other pieces used at this demonstration through a perspective that focuses on the combination of populist and nationalist discourses. However, as I would like to give you a broader idea of the field of popular music and populism in Germany, I will now move on to another German language example that does not focus on the use of music by populist politicians or parties. I selected an example from German Schlager music that I consider quite instructive regarding the performance of populism. Uh, the example is Die Dorfrocker. The band Die Dorfrocker consists of three brothers, Philipp, Tobias, and Markus Thoman from Upper Franconia. Founded in 2005 as a party rock band, they first gained attention throughout Germany with an appearance at the Spring Festival of German Folk Music in 2007. The band built on this success in 2011 with the song Auf der Alm, which celebrates the hedonistic lifestyle in a mountain hut. The song was chosen as the theme song for the popular TV show Die Alm, The Mountain Hut. The, the Dorfrocker's success story continued throughout the 2010s. Three albums made it to the top 10 of the German charts. And in 2017, the band was nominated for the most prestigious German folk music award, the Echo for German folk music. Interestingly, over the last decade, the group developed a branding that relies on strategies of polarization as they began to contrast the celebration of rural lifestyles with a devaluation of other seemingly elitist ways of life. The best known song from this period that performs this dualism is titled Dorfkind. The chorus goes, I am a village kid and I'm proud of it. For we village kids are made of good wood. I am a village kid. What could be more beautiful than living in the countryside? Now, while glorifying rural culture and language, the song claims that the lifestyle um, of, of people from the city um, is deficient. Although people living in cities think that people from the countryside are, quote, a little dumb, unquote, they nevertheless spend their vacation on farms and thus, in reality, long for a rural lifestyle. While the song Dorfkin still makes a vague and relatively mild juxtaposition of two social groups, other pieces by the band subsequently intensified social antagonisms. 
The track Mettbrötchen, for instance, makes a distinction between eaters of raw pork and organic eating, eating vegans. In case you're not familiar with this dish, um, <laughs> a Mettbrötchen is a bread roll with raw ground pork, usually topped with raw onions. Um, the chorus says, I'd rather have Met, Met, Mettbrötchen, Met, Met, Mettbrötchen. I could fall in love with onion topped Mettbrötchen. Um, and I would like to play a short excerpt of the music video to give you an impression of the video. Okay, so the song does not merely celebrate men's pork, uh, especially the accompanying video stages the band as actors in a conflict. While vegans are portrayed as oversensitive, uh, sorry, as oversensitive and concerned, planning their diets meticulously, the band members seem to enjoy life to the fullest, dancing together with reality TV star Gina Lisa Lofink in front of two halves of pork in a slaughterhouse. In fact, the enjoyment of life and the lust for pork are performed as inseparable. In addition, the band associates itself with signs of social protest against veganism. The words no vegan are inscribed on one of the pork halves in the style of a self-written protest sign. The Met seems so threatened that a Met man in a superhero costume has to be on his way to save it. That all this is staged in an ironic and playful way does not change the fact that the video tries to entertain by taking a clear position in a cultural conflict, mocking vegans by reaffirming cliches of a detached urban lifestyle. Met is more than just a spread here. It is a marker of a classed white German identity. As the German newspaper NRZ put it in 2018, Met is homeland turned through the grinder, the Tatar of the little man. As a symbol, Met connects associations of nationality, class, and whiteness, and thus not entirely coincidentally, is also popular at AFD events. Um, this this picture of a Met cake served at an AFD election party during the last federal election was distributed widely by German media, um, for instance. So regardless of this parallel to the AFD's appropriation of Met, um, the music video of Mettbrötchen performs a kind of populist aesthetic. The flaunting of the low, that is the proud celebration of what is widely considered lowbrow seems obvious in its references to reality TV and the close-ups of the musicians taking huge, bite, uh, huge bites of the Mettbrötchen while slowly squeezing the overtly thick layer of Met out of the bread roll in the way Gina Lisa Lofink chews while still having traces of Met on her lips and the lack of concern for bad breath after eating onions in the Germanish style restaurant decorated with gingerbread hearts and lighting chains, and the mocking provocations and silly puns, and the appropriation of the narrow space of a slaughterhouse as a stage, and in the disregard for hygiene standards. All of this is then combined with a more global cartoon pop aesthetic. Musically, similar aspects can be observed. The tuba and the accordion provide folkloristic, even comical elements, while other aspects are borrowed from global rock and pop music. The rhythmic accompaniment to the chorus, for instance, is reminiscent of a Queen's We Will Rock You. The song's chorus also invites people to sing along and celebrate with abandoned spaces, such as party tents or the Beer König Club on the Spanish island of Mallorca, where the Dorfrockers used to entertain German tourists before the pandemic. The music video to Medbrötchen thus in many ways performs an aesthetic at the interface of populism and nationalism. And although we have not been able to do participant observation at Dorfrocker live shows as we had intended to um, due to the pandemic, uh, even though we could not do that, we do know that the song has entertained millions of Germans in Germany and Mallorca and that it could only do so because it appealed to them. Um, I hope that by selecting these examples, I managed to uh, demonstrate the relevance of populism theory for the study of European popular music and of popular music culture for the study of populism. 
due to its adaptability, populism defined as discourse and performance can be a central aspect of a large variety of contemporary popular music cultures. Yet taken by itself, populism is a rather thin concept that does not mean much when it is used independently of other political discourses and ideologies. In all of the examples I provided, populism appears in connection with nationalism. Even the Dorf rockers perform xenophobic and nationalist Schlager elsewhere, which helps to contextualize the science they play with in this music video at the interface of exclusionary nationalism and populism. Populism's thinness complicates its study in popular culture, as we need to relate the concept to other thicker discourses. If it is used indiscriminately, populism threatens to obscure other historically grounded and culturally grounded um, discourses, including nationalism. Listening for populism in popular music then requires listening for and articulating the discourses with which populism is linked in a given context. If we do acknowledge populism's interconnectivity with other discourses, however, the concept can be illuminating. Um, first, it reveals aspects of the way in which parties seek to reach people on an effective level. The use of music by the far-right populist AFD is decidedly different than the use of music by other far-right organizations. It is much more eclectic and relies on popular music icons, such as Reinhard May, who can be located on the left rather than on the right, but whose music articulates the, popular, the party's populist sentiments. Second, if it is used beyond party politics, the concept of populism may illuminate the ways in which music interacts with larger populist discourses. In a German language context, for instance, Schlager music has for a long time served as a realm in which a conservative, patriarchal, and white German culture could be imagined. However, Schlager aesthetics hardly performed class antagonisms corresponding to social conflicts. The mocking performance of a conflict between fun-loving meat eaters and affected vegans seems new to Schlager performances and may indicate a new mode of politicized performance within this genre. And um, we can make similar observations regarding populist performances in other musical genres. So it's not exclusively a Schlager phenomenon. Um, I just selected this example for this talk. Now, from a political perspective, I believe that there is a true advantage in this visibility and audibility of populism in European popular culture. Popular music articulates smoldering political and social conflicts in messy ways, and thereby provides educators with concrete signs, symbols, sounds, and affects that can serve as a basis for political education and debate. In this way, the music video to Medbrötchen, for instance, can serve as an excellent impulse to problematize how masculinity, class, whiteness, populism, and nationalism relate to public debates on nutrition, taste, manners, as well as visual and musical aesthetics. For the popular success of populist and nationalist performances relies on the extent to which audiences are willing to critically engage with them. So um, I hope that my talk gave you an impression of what listening for populism means to me. Uh, and what it may entail regarding European and um, German popular musics. And uh, I look forward to our discussion. Thank you.